So our first speaker today is a doc, uh, professor right now, uh, Edward Schwitterman from um, University of California, Riverside. Uh, uh, Eddie is going to be a new faculty at UCR starting this fall, if I'm uh, correct. And so congratulations. And uh, he's going to talk about uh, planetary technosignatures in the context of uh, search for remote biosignatures. Yeah, th thanks, Ravi. And thank you to the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak today. Um, I, I was encouraged by many of you, including especially uh, Jacob, to sort of talk about um, the technosignatures in the context of the search for, for biosignatures, because these are complementary ways of looking for life, maybe life at different you know, levels of advancement. Um, and, and certainly, if we're going to spend the resources to spectrally um, um, analyze exoplanets for signatures of life, then that's also a way to piggyback uh, some searches for planetary technosignatures. And so except for the very beginning of the talk, when I talk about planetary technosignatures, I'll mostly be discussing those that you can find only through the analysis of a planetary spectrum. So not like optical pulses or radio signals or artifacts, which are also important, but not within the scope of what I'm uh, mostly going to be discussing. Uh, because those are the, the ones that are most directly analogous to biosignatures and the ones that are, would be plausibly detectable pot potentially with uh, future NASA missions that could detect biosignatures. And so some of, a lot of what's learned uh, has come out of this Nexus Biosignature Detection Workshop that was held in 2016. Many of the people who are um, currently attending this conference um, also attended this workshop. And the goal of the workshop was to sort of create a, a state of the field a uh, series of papers that were the state of the field in biosignatures um, and sort of add anything that maybe had been missed before, cat categorize um, a, a series of biosignatures, and really get uh, a multidisciplinary uh, task force together. Uh, because the fundamental questions in, in exoplanet biosignature science really demand a highly interdisciplinary approach. Uh, some of these questions are what, is, what does life produce? Uh, can a dead planet fool us? How do we interpret limited data? How do we quantify uncertainties? There's a clear role for biologists, uh, for, for geochemists, for, geo, for other geoscientists, for atmospheric chemists, for astronomers, and, and for people who think about statistical analyses of, of large data sets. And this workshop resulted in a series of papers uh, published in the journal Astrobiology. Um, and so these are, are, are uh, summarized here. They include um, you know, a review of, of, of currently known biosignatures, um, an in-depth treatment of oxygen as a biosignature, um, and, and when it could be a, a strong indicator of a planetary biosphere and when it may be as it's in fact a, a result of an abiotic process, a framework for the assessment of those biosignatures, uh, future directions um, that, that were is new, new material that was added to the field um, as a direct result of collaborations among uh, members of the workshop and some observational prospects um, led by primarily observers that talked about how these biosignatures um, uh, related to upcoming uh, observatories and mission concepts. Now, of course, this isn't the, the entirety of the biosignature science literature. I've listed just a small sampling of other biosignature reviews um, below uh, this summary, um, which are also important to check out. It's certainly an active and, and growing field. And I think that's sort of what Jacob was getting at, where, where biosignature science has been supported, technosignature science so much, and so how do we get them to meet uh, together? And so um, one question, important question you might ask is, what is a planetary biosignature? Um, uh, uh, Demeray et al. in the 2008 Astrobiology Roadmap defined a biosignature, which is a more general term, as an object, substance, or pattern whose origin specifically requires a biological agent. Of course, they're also including biomarkers and, say, rocks in that uh, definition. A planetary biosignature is evidence for life derived from the analysis of a planetary spectrum, so it has to be remotely detectable. And so on the left is sort of an Earth, Earth sign spectrum uh, uh, of, of our own planet, with spectral signatures of, of certain processes that happen in our, in, our, in our planet, including life. And so the steps here are, are one, to detect a feature, two, to attribute that feature to a gas substance or material, and three, to infer a process from that uh, material or gas. Um, and so one example is oxygen. Um, you have to detect the, say, 0.76 micron band. You have to say that 0.76 micron band is, is indeed oxygen and not something else that's creating that absorption feature. Um, attribute that gas to, say, photosynthesis, oxygenic photosynthesis, um, is, is the process that you've inferred from that. Uh, there are uh, potentially many different types of, of biosignatures. So gaseous biosignatures is just one. 
one example, of course, that's often cited is oxygen, uh, because on our, at least our own, on our own planet today, uh, the sinks of oxygen would, would easily overwhelm uh, the sources over geologic time. And so it requires an active um, a, a source to maintain. Another is the photolytic product of that oxygen, which is ozone, uh, which is detectable at a different region of the spectrum in the mid-infrared versus the optical. There's also surface biosignature. So one example that's commonly uh, given is the vegetation red edge, which is the sharp contrast and reflectance of uh, plant material or, or, or bacterial mats between near-infrared, uh, uh, which is highly reflective, and the visible where uh, chlorophyll is absorbing to generate uh, energy and, uh, and, and build biomass. Another example could be pigment suspended in water. And then finally, there's temporal biosignature. So there are seasonal changes in, say, the CO2 abundance on Earth that's directly traced to the productivity of the biosphere. Um, what is a good planetary biosignature? Of course, it has to be produced by life, but it also has to be global in extent, has to produce uh, observable features and be global in extent. So uh, uh, chemosynthesizers, you know, clinging to life in a subsurface and exoplanet probably isn't going to create an observable signature. So when we're looking for remote biosignatures, we're probably looking for uh, highly productive biospheres that can change the characteristics of their planetary spectrum. Um, another important factor to think about is survivability. So those gases, if, if we're talking about biosignature gases, need to survive the photochemical destruction from, say, ultraviolet light from their host star. Um, and they need to be separable from abiotic processes. And that's an important consideration as well. Why search for biosignatures? Um, I mean, if, if we're thinking about searching for civilizations, uh, we have the, the Drake equation. We've made really uh, 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 astounding uh, leaps in getting this F of P value, the, the fraction of stars with planets, uh, from Kepler ground-based RV surveys. And we know it's, you know, plants are very common. There's, there's, a, there's a, almost a planet for every star. And we're even getting occurrence rates in, say, the habitable zone. One of the next uh, features to get is, what is this F of L subvalue? So uh, uh, what, what fraction of, of planets that exist um, actually, actually have a planetary biosphere? And this is important for the search for technosignatures because probably uh, a, a, an advanced civilization has to result from the planetary evolution from a simple planetary biosphere to, to a technosphere. And so this is really important contextual information that could inform uh, the success or failure of the search for technosignatures. And uh, there are some attributes in the search for, for biosignatures I, I wanted to quickly uh, discuss. One is, um, and, and how to compare them with technosignatures. Um, so one is specificity, which I think the, there's a clear advantage to technosignatures here. It's a confidence of signatures due to life or technology. There's an abundant amount of literature about false positives for biosignatures and how to mitigate against them. Technosignatures um, aren't always probably going to be completely 100% uh, attributable to technology. There probably will have to be um, um, sort of an analysis of that. But, but, but it is, it is uh, we should concede that te techno technosignatures are going to be more easily fingerprinted as evidence of technology than say a biosignature is evidence of, of life. A uh, range, we could probably search for most technosignatures over a much larger volume than we can search for, um, than we can search for biosignatures. Where biosignatures might have an advantage is longevity. Um, if the L, L life, so the, the length of time the planet hosts a planetary biosphere is longer than, uh, significantly longer than the amount of time it hosts a planetary technosphere. Now, finding biosignatures is a huge technical challenge. Um, you know, the contrast ratio between Earth and the sun is uh, one in uh, 10 billion. And, um, and, you know, really low magnitude, volumetric magnitude of like, say, 28. Um, and we need really advanced technology, such as those posed by the uh, LUVAR and HABEX missions to detect an Earth-like planet and gain its spectrum. The advantage is that we can get a volume-limited survey that can provide uh, a statistical assessment of the occurrence of planetary biospheres in the solar neighborhood. And that can be more or less a complete uh, sample. And so uh, if, 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 our, if our telescope is large enough, say a 10 meter Luvar type telescope, we can get over 50 uh, uh, planets in the habitable zone and analyze their spectrum for evidence of, of biosignatures. And, and, and therefore set at least an upper limit on, on the fraction of planets that host life, uh, or at least host global planetary biospheres that produce uh, detectable biosignatures. Uh, technosignatures may be at a disadvantage here, and I mean specifically planetary technosignatures, because unlike other forms of technosignatures, we can only search the same planets we're searching for biosignatures. So if most planets spend most of their time as uh, simple, you know, 
as, as, as without techno technology, uh, then they'll far outnumber those that don't. But that's an assumption that we make um, that's not necessarily proven yet. And so what plant, the planetary techno signature search would do is it would tell us whether N tech is anywhere near N life. If we can search both for techno signatures and biosignatures at the same time. And that search is free if we're just utilizing the same wavelengths and sensitivities that we're use, utilizing for the biosignature search. This is uh, relevant to a paper uh, by Jacob Hack Misra about uh, constraining the great filter and a poster that he'll be presenting uh, later this week. Um, and the, the planetary techno signatures that may exist can exist in direct analogy to biosignatures. So they're atmospheric gases that we may look for, um, um, such as CFCs or PFCs. I'll talk about one, which is uh, uh, sulfur hexafluoride. Uh, service features like solar panels, artificial light emission, which will be a talk. Uh, um, uh, land formations uh, revealed by rotational uh, mapping, which will be talked later this week, and maybe perhaps even temporal features that all exist in direct analogy to, to biosignatures. Um, I wanted to go over a little bit of um, sort of some lessons learned from biosignatures, though, because not everything that exists in a planetary atmosphere will be detectable. So what I've shown here is sort of a, um, a, 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 a modest resolution spectrum of the Earth, which is far greater than the resolving power we'll get from say a HAVEX or LUVAR telescope, this is Earth in reflected light from point um, from point two to to two to two microns, and I've overplotted the the uh, channels for the HAVEX mission, uh, so the UV, VIS, uh, and near eye channels, and I've also labeled the prominent absorption features in, in Earth spectrum, including ozone, uh, oxygen, water, uh, and carbon dioxide. And so, what happens when we put uh, uh, error bars on this? And so, this is a simulated um, uh, 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 this is a simulated spectrum of Earth orbiting a nearby uh, star that's a, a big target uh, for biosignature surveys, which is a beta CVN. It's about 8.7 light years away, I believe. And so, um, and so these, ha these error bars are sort of on the order of what we'd expect from a 100 hour integration to each um, spect uh, spectroscopic uh, channel. And so what we can see here is that HAVEX would, would possess the resolution and sensitivity to confirm the presence of biosignature gases like oxygen, ozone, and water. Uh, but detecting, say, methane would be a, a substantial challenge and require substantially higher abundances of this gas than exists in our atmosphere today. So it's not just the presence of the gas, it's, it's the abundance. And I have a, a sort of a, a simulation that shows this. This is a, a suite of simulations of a of modern Earth with clouds uh, with varying levels of methane. So the, the black line is zero uh, ppm methane. Uh, 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 the, the, the blue line is the current level of methane, 1.8 ppm in our atmosphere. And then the green line is 100 times the amount of methane we have in our atmosphere. And you can sort of see the, how the sensitivity of these bands evolve uh, in response to the abundance of the gas. And so uh, even though you know, methane has a band at 1.65 microns, substantially more methane than exists in our atmosphere today would probably be required for something like HABEX or LUVAR um, to detect it. And so that's just a lesson that it's not just the presence of the gas in the atmosphere, but it's abundance uh, in relation to the resolving power and capabilities of the telescope. Uh, this is not necessarily true uh, for Earth throughout its history. Earth, Earth's atmosphere composition revealed through geochemical proxy record has evolved substantially through time. And so earlier in history, methane was probably a lot more detectable. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, oxygen for the first half of our history was not detectable. Um, and this has to do with the evolution of various metabolisms and, and, and the, the, the um, uh, overwhelming of certain sources and sinks in the planetary environment, which is still an active area of study, uh, is something we can only do for the Earth because of our uh, access to that geochemical archive. Um, but one, one thing, this is, a, this is a, on, the, on the right, this is a plot from the HAVEX report, tracing Earth's uh, uh, spectral evolution through time. And I thought it might be interesting, an interesting idea to sort of think about a, a future techno signature Earth as an added panel here at the bottom. Um, in analogy to um, the, uh, uh, Adam Frank's 2017 uh, paper on the Anthropocene and, and, and how that relates to the detectability of technos uh, technospheres and the classes of planets. Eddie, you have uh, one or two minutes. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So the other thing is uh, observing mode. So the, the mode of observation is important. So th this is a transmission spectrum, and, and this just shows the, the, the spe uh, sensitivity envelopes for various um, uh, 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 flagship missions. Oxygen is not detectable in transmission, uh, while it is detectable uh, uh, in reflected light spectroscopy with, say, HAVEX or LUVAR. 
Um, on the other hand, um, things like methane and nitrous oxide are accessible in transmission for modern Earth-like composition, whereas they would not be in reflected light. Um, the, the stellar flux uh, drives different uh, photochemical lifetimes for gases, and that's important for biosignature gases. It's probably also important for te uh, conceivable technosignature gases. Um, and uh, the biosignature community has created various ways of mitigating against potential false positives based on planetary context, the different forms of gases you may find in that atmosphere. It may be worth doing something similar uh, for technosignatures. I, uh, I dropped this in the Slack channel uh, earlier, but this is just an, sort of an example technosignature I, uh, I thought of based on a paper by uh, Marinova, McKay, and Hashimoto in 2005 about uh, a model for warming Mars with artificial greenhouse gases. And so I just stuck the amount of, say, sulfur uh, uh, hexafluoride they calculated would be required to warm early Mars into a spectral simulator and generated uh, the spectral features. And so if a planet really was, was terraformed with an amount of that, the gas that's, that's uh, uh, sufficient to, to create the radio forcing that would warm a planet like Mars, it would produce uh, detectable spectroscopic features that could be sought in, say, uh, transmission or uh, emission spectro uh, spectroscopy. And so I'll just throw my conclusions up here. Uh, the search for biosignatures is important in the context of the search for uh, uh, technosignatures. Um, there are a lot of lessons that we can learn uh, uh, from the biosignature community and apply potentially to planetary uh, technosignatures specifically. Um, so thank you for your attention uh, to my talk.